Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, the last session of the day, normally the more, uh, you know, kind of the graveyard shift out here. Um, obviously, we are kind of, you know, Anand, we've discussed several times, uh, I've been quite keen on having a financing session, even within what is, what is essentially a very technology focused conference. But the reason today is that obviously, you know, a lot of finances are depending on technology to really bail them out. And a lot of uh, the technology companies really depending on availability of cheap finance to bail them out. So it's really a very symbiotic relationship now between the finances and suppliers and, and producers of electricity. Um, I have with me a very distinguished panel. Um, I think we shall wait for Mr. Sanjeev Gupta who will join us in a few minutes. The way, uh, you know, uh, the way I'd like to do it is we'll probably have a few uh, opening remarks by each of the panel members. Uh, we can then, you know, take any questions that we have within the panel and people within the audience, any kind of questions that you have, feel free to raise it, uh, post the opening remarks. So let me, let me kind of just, you know, lay out what, what we're going to be looking at or talking about today. Uh, when we look at financing for a renewable project, right? Um, to me, a renewable project is a very classical case of a financing problem because you have a large investment and then you have returns over a period of time. Clearly time value of money kicks in, clearly that's where a good financing structure, and I don't necessarily mean a cheap financing structure, but a good one, uh, can make a huge difference to uh, the risk in the project, to the returns that players get in the project, and to the uh, to ensuring the reliability of a project and its ability to actually, uh, you know, continue continue serving the purpose for which it was set up, which is essentially to supply power at an attractive rate to various off takers. Again, when you look at financing, we have classically looked at it in two ways, right? One is the equity side of things and the other is from a debt side. Of course, the dividing line between the two gets thinner and thinner as more financial engineers get in. Uh, today, you have a lot of debt masquerading as equity and a little bit of equity also kind of being inserted into debt. But clearly, you're then looking at two kinds of investors. Uh, investor who puts the money in hoping to capture the residual value and take on the significant risk of the project and a lender who is actually looking at getting back his principal and an interest at a right level. Now, when you, when you look at equity and debt, clearly we need to have some balance of the two and some kind of right pricing of the two in order to make a project viable. What we will talk about is various forms in which the equity and debt can take and what the, what the future looks like. But to me, the most interesting thing today is that India still has a very classical model of, of financing projects, which is a classical X percent of equity and the X fortunately has been coming down from 30 to 25 to 20. Um, and the rest of it is debt, debt in the form of project finance with some sculpted cash flows looking to repay through essentially almost the, the useful life of the project, less a few years. In effect, assumes that there's no residual value, in effect, assumes that you need to kind of match the cash flows arising from the project with the debt repayments. International markets have gone in a very different way. Uh, in fact, international markets have one significant difference, which is they look at construction and post-construction very, very, very differently. Uh, construction is seen as a preserve of, um, you know, of a bank and various, you know, lenders, engineers and others around a bank will be able to assist the construction risk. Post-construction is seen as essentially annuity style returns where fixed income managers who are looking at, uh, looking at an assured yield do actually look at investing in these kind of projects. Um, here what you have is really a hybrid of the two and we'll, we'll kind of discuss how even that is going to evolve. So maybe, maybe as I start, um, maybe I can just start with um, Pratik, right? Um, Pratik actually is one of the larger banks in the Indian ecosystem now financing renewable projects, right? Uh, and clearly you see yourself as not just in debt, but probably more moving into a higher risk debt, more into mezzanine style debt. How do you see this evolving for you? What do you think is going to be different in the next three years as compared to what it was in the last three years with a specific focus on lending to renewable projects? That's a good question. You, uh, you are right. We have, uh, we have traveled a fair bit of journey in terms of uh, financing renewable energy in India now, having, having funded close to 4.5 gigawatt projects in renewable uh, equally between solar and wind and obviously that leadership in the lending side has translated to uh, translated to uh, leadership and deal activity on the investment making side as well so uh, coming back to so coming back to the question uh, that, uh, that that mr mukund has just asked 
Yes, uh, there is. Uh, uh, so I would classify uh, renewable energy financing between two periods. One is I would say pre-2014 and after 2014. Pre-2014, the equity was more early stage equity and all the developers were looking to build capacity, large capacities. And post 2014, we have seen equity and debt kind of sort of sort of, uh, sort of come uh, come in a middle way in terms of quasi equity financing or mezzanine equity financing as those portfolios which were, which are financed before 2013 grow bigger and larger. So now, if you would see, there there are a lot of investors who are looking at mezzanine funding for renewable energy at the whole co level, uh, spe specifically for funding growth projects. As far as CS Bank is concerned, we are also equally interested in that model. And if some good opportunity comes in, where, wherein we can look at some structured financing somewhere between equity and debt, depending on various risk, risk level, you, uh, it, it would be uh, something very interesting to evaluate uh, going forward. I think um, clearly, again, looking at debt most mess style financing, right, which, which is nothing but in effect a kind of much more aggressive top up of debt over yeah, the standard yeah. 70, 30, or 75, 25. Yeah. Uh, do you see, do you kind of, as a bank, are you comfortable then looking at now refinancing projects post construction, post stabilization, uh, post having received, say, having seen an entire season of operation? Yeah. Uh, are you then comfortable really going into uh, financing different amounts that are more a function of the cash generated by the project rather than the kind of the asset value of the project? Yes. So what you are referring to is moving from a very uh, moving from a bit of a corporate finance kind of model to a proper project finance kind of model, where you can sec uh, securitize cash flows and refinance projects based specifically on the strength of the project, and that that, that is something we would be keen to uh, evaluate. I think on that side, equally with the banks, I would say a bond market is also something that is picking up, and. Uh, in times to come, and if we have to finance the large gigawatt kind of targets that we are looking at, I think banks and the bond markets will have to come together and look at a lot of securitization of cash flows of the existing projects purely on the balance sheet of the or purely on the recourse to the project. So I think that is something which will have to be done. It is something which, uh, as, as for banks, banks are banks have traveled fair bit of distance and have still some distance to travel. But that, that is something which will have to happen eventually. Uh, good point about bonds. Uh, I'll come back to that when you speak about refinancing. Um, sort of, uh, you know, obviously one interesting thing that we've seen in renewables has been the fact that the non-bank finance companies have really kind of come into the space and captured it, right? Uh, historically, we always saw the NBFCs as being more looking at the smaller size, looking, looking more at things that you think would suit their balance sheet capability, uh, or looking at just smaller size loans like in retail. But I think the first case we've really seen the NBFCs coming in big size, large players, and essentially today making a huge difference to the availability of project finance has been from the NBFCs. What do you think has given the NBFCs the advantage as compared to traditional banks? So essentially, um, as you said, you know, historically banks were the ones who had been doing project finance in India. And the, the problems in the last decade around infrastructure and all had, you know, uh, they had beaten down the bank balance sheet so much, the banks were very skeptical to start with a sector which did not have a proven track record, uh, one. And two, even the larger players that were there, there was hardly anybody with pro uh, capabilities demonstrate capabilities to let's say set up a project or operate it for uh, you know life let's say like a 20 years pro uh, a project with 25 year ppa would essentially have you know require uh, 15 20 years of financing now uh, in the early stage projects which were done uh, in late 2000s they were around ad and none of them were actually ipp they were intended to generate power so lenders never had that confidence per se the traditional banks never had that confidence whereas nbfcs uh, by virtue of, I would say, being uh, you know, smaller in size at the time when the industry was going through that pain, uh, largely skipped that period where uh, they had to go through a lot of stress assets on their books, which is still uh, prevalent on the bank's balance sheets. NBFCs, uh, one, they were willing to take uh, calls on uh, you know, assets which, were, which had shown some promise in global markets. And where uh, you know investors, initial investors or early stage uh, investors were willing to extend balance sheet supports. Now, from early early days in renewable, when they would essentially be supported by a, a guarantee from uh, a promoter, 
to a purely project finance and further moving down to you know mail structures and yield co stepping in and taking over projects so we i think in the last 5 years itself we've come a long way but you said probably today the investors a lot of investors we see today are not you know typical utilities we see and uh, you know that is where the banks still see that concern of uh, you know their capability and willingness to hold the project for 20 years and correspondingly their ability to you know withstand any issues let's say during the tenure of the of the uh, loan i would say or or financing so nbfcs essentially have uh, partnered with would say developers where they would take that initial risk price it in suitably and then at the same time work with developers to actually uh, you know help them uh, see through that construction period that uh, period of risk and uh, come to a stage where it's acceptable risk for lenders and that's how we've seen mainstream lenders at least in the private sector who have picked up in last couple of years really well we we have already seen uh, i think psu banks who started lending to the space but there's a lot of lenders who are still not comfortable doing doing renewable projects and i believe if uh, we are to reach anywhere close to the numbers that uh, our honorable prime minister aspires we have to see a full scale participation from the banking system and the bond and yield codes will have will step in at a later stage but without uh, probably uh, you know psu banks stepping in nbfcs can you know we've brought the sector to this stage but without a bank participation i don't think we are we are going into 50 gigawatt or or 100 gigawatts scale i think quite clearly yeah, the banks have been burned by what's been happening in the other infrastructure space uh, but interestingly if you look at renewables that's one sector where today the you know project conception to cod is probably the lowest among any other sectors in india uh, and given some of the celebrated problems that you have in india regarding land that you have regarding just poor project planning essentially uh, renewables kind of help you get around it just because of the short compressed time frames what do you think is going to differentiate or what do you think is the strategy of your firm in terms of ensuring that you don't go down the banking route where the banks route in terms of having assets that are kind of unviable over time what is it that you're doing today and what will you continue to do so uh, i i'll not look at you know these 2.44 and these numbers because we've not uh, done even probably sub 4 in last years but uh, if i look at our portfolio and probably uh, you know we've stuck to players who've had track record or or pe- people who've had uh, exhibited you know capability to let's say withstand issues now so a large part of our portfolio would be uh, you know larger platforms probably domestic uh, large domestic groups uh, utilities of the likes of let's say a semcorp or an ng or or a fortum so people who have who we know understand the business because who are uh, as i said we've done we've also done those projects where you know we knew that, that the sponsors are uh, going to be you know flipping those projects in probably 3 years 5 years time but then those were days when the projects had margins for error with the kind of numbers that we are seeing and and every bid is a new benchmark i would say that each and every lender will have to get more cautious because right now as i see the margin for error is getting squeezed out and if the things were to start going wrong i don't know where we'll head because we are still very early in the journey towards those uh, huge numbers of 160 gigawatt or likes so i think to start with lenders will have to stick to investors who have capability in terms of execution in terms of probably operating and managing those assets and you know uh, maybe even balance sheet support if required to see through the issues because uh, you know i am sure these bits that we are seeing they are all factoring in the upsides which which we have assumed right a continuous decline in probably uh, panel prices which may or may not come through with it has happened in the short term but that doesn't guarantee you visibility for next 24 months and uh, similarly the interest rate cycles in india we have seen cycles already so we can't assume the interest rate to be continue to be benign for 20 years and still you know not leave anything on the table for probably or any day so i would say uh, for nbfcs to and, and for us also uh, we've been conservative in terms of who we are lending to the projects we are lending to rather than just chasing a number and uh, and i can proudly say i mean we have a nil np on our book predominantly because we've chosen our our uh, investments very diligently
obviously you know long term projects lend itself to financing they also lend itself to the fact to a lot of legal work because you need to proof you know ensure that you adequately protect yourself not just for the next few years but essentially for the life of the project 25 years current from your experience you know having looked at a range of project financing having looked at a range of uh, project financing in other sectors and in renewables uh, and having looked at the kind of renewable ppas that we have in place what do you think has distinguished some of the renewable ppas from um, you know other for example power sector ppas itself uh thanks mukund just taking off on uh, the comparison of the other sectors uh, i'd just like to talk for uh, a few minutes on the magical numbers of 2.44 and 2.62 um we've seen a history of project financing happening where there was uh, aggressive financing in the road space there was aggressive financing in the umpp space there was aggressive financing in the steel sector and in all those conditions uh they are in a very very bad nps situation today uh primarily because the assumptions that were taken at that time turned out to be wrong and i think that has already some something that has started for the renewable space with the gst math not working out correctly for most uh, developers we don't know what percentage it is i think most developers anticipated it would be somewhere between it would be 5 so they took into account a 7% number but it's surely going to be more than that so the the point is that the assumptions have to be correct and they have to be accurate because i think renewable is the last straw for this country to meet its energy demands after where we are on thermal and you know in the other sectors the second thing is that i think most of us when we go on highway trips we end up complaining somewhat about the highways and that has a lot to do with quality control uh so recently um uh india the mnre has got some quality control guidelines that were sent out and uh, i think that should help but the gestation of 25 years is going to be put to aggressive testing with the uh, the modules that have come and uh, i do hope that uh, they pass that test but uh, market perception is that 25 years seems very tough for these modules to sort of last for that amount of period in spite of the warranties coming through so the pps as such uh, i think there's been an aggressive uh, demand for guarantees to be given by the procurer which has finally come through in the uh, reva ppa which has enhanced credit rating uh, tremendously for these projects we've had a talk with a lot of foreign investors who wanted to come in but they weren't uh, comfortable with even the seki uh, bids because of the balance sheet of seki but i think the guarantees that are being given have uh, given great comfort to them and that is a big boost that has come in in a lot of these ppas you mentioned about gst right um, i think yeah uh, you mentioned about gst we um obviously i think people are just kind of making up to the fact that here was an unknown i mean not that was it known i think there's an expectation the seki will make sure that uh, any adjustment in the capital cost etc is adjusted to, due to gst is compensated adequately from a legal perspective what do you think are the ways out for the system as a whole i'm not necessarily saying for developers but for developers for off takers and for uh, you know the mnr What do you think are the ways out, and how will they really account for the fact that GST probably wasn't factored in at for various trades and for various projects? So I, I think I've answered uh, or tried to find an answer to that question for at least uh, six of uh, my clients over the last twenty-four hours, and uh, we've gone through the various provisions of the PPA and. Uh, unfortunately you know there is an argument being made that this is change in law but if you look at the definition of change in law in most of these ppas the definition talks about change in the tax rates relating to the supply of electricity not procurement of modules so whether procurement of modules or any other activities will fall within that broad ambit and uh, if a representation is made to the concerned authorities whether they would entertain that uh, i have my reservations on that to be honest um 
even if they do entertain it, they'd have to make a very strong case because the literal the interpretation doesn't really support it as per the PPA. And shortly after the entire uh, Adani Tata battle, where they lost in the Supreme Court vis a vis the imported coal, uh, arguments like force majeure, et cetera, can definitely not be taken in this scenario. So, yeah, I, I don't know, unless they work outside the contractual framework, which also is not uh, possible because it's a competitive bidding process, there will be a huge amount of challenges if there's any relaxation given at this stage. Uh, I don't see a way out in the short term for this, for the bids that have already happened. And of course, I'm assuming that developers will factor in the revised rate of GST for the new bids and the prices will show a slight uptrend from here on. Uh, Pratik, sir, as uh, lenders were lend to these projects, especially projects that you can, in the process of sanctioning or just sanction but not yet achieve COD, uh, how do you think, uh, I mean, what, what seems to be the way forward to address changes to the GST? So I think uh, Karan probably has, you know, have more detailed input, but in the past we've seen projects where uh, CERC has approved in change in tax rates under, under change of law and uh, the impact of change in tax rate has been passed on to developers. So we've seen that in the past. Of course, uh, the structure of current PPAs need to be seen, but there's definitely a precedence where the CERC has considered that uh, as a valid argument. Also, you know, there is a slight, slight difference between what, say, um, Tata Mundra went through in terms of change in law and what the industry is going to see in renewables this time. Tata Mundra was a direct, the direct issue of change in cash flows for the uh, for the developer because of change in coal prices it, it was linked to the pricing of power and here in this case it is a change in the tax rate with respect to module procurement so from a lender perspective and, and i'm talking purely from a lender perspective and not from an investor perspective a lend, lender has more strict sort of covenants on the cash flow side whether the lender is getting that money back or not and from that perspective this risk is a fail, uh, not, not as big as it is for the developers on the equity side. That is one point that I wanted to make on this. Let me now go to the next favorite topic of everybody in the, in the market. Uh, we have seen some very aggressive bids, both not just on the solar side, but actually even on the wind side. Um, it basically introduces a lot of questions around the viability of these projects and whether these projects will ever see the light of day. As a financer, and you clearly made a point that you wouldn't be financing these 2.44 kind of projects, not even below four. Do you, do you really think that these projects therefore are kind of doomed and will not see the light of day unless maybe there's a 100% equity kind of infusion? Or do you see any kind of redeeming features that may end up in actually making this a viable project both for a lender and for an investor? Of course, so I, I didn't say that we are not, not going to do any of those projects. But the viability of these uh, projects need to be established very strongly because we need to clearly understand what are the assumptions that have been taken. And as I uh, mentioned earlier, is there a room for error? Let's say probably a, a GST again, if somebody not factored in GST, now, uh, or probably could, there could be another state levy that comes in uh, three years down. So are we leaving enough room for you know, changes which may be even temporary in nature? But then which will impact cash flows or even project servicing. So as I said, we'll have to again go back to look at, you know, rather than individual small uh, projects, portfolios where they would have capabilities to support because end of the day, I'm sure none of the lenders are uh, going to be comfortable with developers who have very small capa uh, capability and track record as well as financial flexibility to support projects at this kind of pricing. So let's say if we look at the kind of names who've gone out to bid for, probably they are some of the largest names. So probably like an SBG, clean tech or all. So who have large commitments. I think and this is a temporary phase where, you know, because of this uh, period of low tenders, that there's an aggressive bidding happening. But I'm sure uh, sanity will prevail because end of the day, uh, this is not, uh, and I hope sanity will prevail because Otherwise, we are looking at another e-com sort of bubble building up here. And, uh, and, and I was just quoting numbers. Uh, I think between 2014 and 15, e-commerce itself saw about 14, 15 billion of equity coming into India, into, into pro companies. And uh, we all know where it is right now. Solar 
probably we've seen barely 2 billion deployed last year and co commitments of another couple of billions. So, but the kind of investor that we are looking at, probably potentially the pension funds, the yield cores, and uh, large utilities, I'm sure they have, all of them have that visibility of uh, capital and probably sanity to bid uh, rationally going forward because at this level, I am sure lender, uh, bidders will find difficult to tie up project financing. And unless, unless it's, you know, uh, supported by you know, so probably a lower debt equity which justifies servicing or, or a balance sheet support or some other comforts that are built in because this number is difficult, it looks for now. 